Hi, it's Tuesday, March the 8th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through the book of Genesis. And today we're going to finish off Genesis chapter 44. It's verses 18 to 34 today. Um, we started the chapter yesterday, and uh, in this chapter, you'll recall, Benjamin has been framed by Joseph for theft, um, having stolen his silver um, chalice, which, of course, he didn't do. Uh, he's been taken into Joseph's custody. He will remain now with Joseph as a, as a prisoner, as, as a slave, uh, for the rest of his life. Um, and his brothers are being sent home to their father. Um, although they have offered to stay together, we would all stay as slaves. Um, Joseph has said, well, no, he's the one who did it. I will keep him. The rest of you, no, you're not guilty of anything. Off you go. Um, and that's where we are right now. So let's pick it up and see what happens next. It's Genesis 44, 18 to 34. Then Judah stepped up to Joseph and said, Oh, my Lord, let your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears and do not be angry with your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead. He alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, so that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes with you, you shall see my face no more. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, go again, buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother goes with us will we go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. And then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, surely he has been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm comes to him, you will bring down my gray hairs in sorrow to Sheol. Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, when he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant began sure, for your servant became surety for the boy, to my father, saying, "If I do not bring him back to you, then I will bear the blame in the sight of my father all of my life." Now, therefore, please let your servant remain as a slave to my lord in place of the boy, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the suffering that would come upon my father. So there it is. What are we to make of that? Well, again, good storytelling uh, and a great case made by Judah. Just saying, you know, please let me stay in his stead. I, I, I will stay because if Benjamin does not go back, if my youngest brother does not go back, my father will die. And I would rather stay here as your prisoner, as your slave. I would rather serve you for the rest of my life than have my father suffer and die. It's a pretty big one. I mean, any of the brothers could have stepped forward, but he's the one. Now, perhaps Judah is the natural leader of, 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 of these guys. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful plea. And, and, and even more powerful, you know, when, when you think about when you think about who Judah is, okay? So in this story, in, in this in this Joseph story, in this Genesis saga, Judah, well, you remember, it was his plan to sell Joseph, right? That, that was his plan. Joseph wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for Judah. Now, in the story, it sounds like Judah's suggesting rather than kill him, let's sell him. Um, and then it's intimated that actually he's going to restore him to his father and make himself look good. Um, but the fact is, Judah's the one who came up with the idea, let's make money on our brother. So not entirely admirable. And speaking of not so admirable, he married a Canaanite woman. And we know we're not happy about our sons marrying Canaanite women. This is a reoccurring theme. Um, 
You may also recall as we went through the story, we took that 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 chapter out just to hear the story of Judah. And I wondered at the time, like, why? Why not about anybody else? Why about Judah? In that chapter, we discover that Judah has two sons who are so wicked that they are put to death by God. We don't know exactly what the wickedness is, but they are so wicked they are put to death by God. The third one remains and should have married the widow of the two sons, right? It's the same same woman. She's as as uh, as his custom married to one they married to the other should marry the third but no 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 uh judah is going to um basically lie and say oh what he's older but he just puts it off puts it off he disenfranchises his daughter-in-law puts her into such a position that the only way she can claim power is by passing herself off as a prostitute and sleeping with him then the that becomes the leverage for her to get what is what is justly hers. And that is the family name, the family protection, all, all of that. Um, so that's who Judah is. The one who would deny his daughter-in-law. The one who has raised at least two sons who were so wicked that God um, disposed of them. Uh, the one who disobeyed his parents and married a Canaanite woman. And also the one who came up with the idea of selling Joseph uh, into slavery. Not ideal. Oh, 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 wait. And, and even more than that, that's right. Before that, we have the story of him, um, of him uh, sexually assaulting or having a, a, a sexual relationship. Hard to tell uh, whether it's consensual or not. Um, with his stepmother. With with um, I, I don't recall which one, uh, but anyway, what one one of one of his brother's mothers, um, and. Um, and again, he may have done that uh, just because that's the kind of guy he is. He may have done that to usurp his father. Um, we talked about at the time, uh, symbolically, what this could mean. Um, but Judah's not a good guy. And yet now Judah's the one who steps up. Judah is the one who is willing to sacrifice himself for his brother and for his father. If we take him at his word... If Benjamin doesn't make it home, dad will die. So rather than seeing the old man die, and, 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 I'm, and I'm not being intentionally cruel about this, but, but the Judah who thinks that we can sell my brother into slavery, which is better than killing him, that guy surely would also go, well, dad is old. Dad is old. He hasn't got a lot of years left. So, you know, really... If he dies now or dies in a couple of years, you know, uh, it's not like he's a young man. Uh, I could see him doing that calculus. The old Judah. The Judah who 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 uh, usurped his father or tried to usurp his father or at least whatever was so bold as to sleep with his with his with with one of his father's wives. That's again the guy who does the calculation. Going, listen, I can be rich, um, and uh, yeah, dad will be upset, but he'll be dead, and then. I guess I'll be in charge because it seems like Judah's taking charge here. So Judah has the opportunity um, through nefarious means, I suppose, through the pain and suffering of others, at least. He has the opportunity to do well for himself. And he won't do it. This is of Judah who has changed. And suddenly the chapter about Judah that just seemed to be popped into the middle of the Joseph story makes sense. It provides us a context for the growth and the change. We see who Judah has been. We see Judah grow. We see Judah grant justice um, to Tamar, to, to, to his, to his daughter-in-law. Um, if, if unwillingly, he does it. And this story makes me believe that it, should that kind of thing happen again, he would do it willingly. He wouldn't have to be pushed. He actually has changed so I think there's an invitation for us to consider how people can change. Now, whether that's meant to be a message for us as we consider all the things that we have done and we despair, by, oh, there's nothing I can do. There's no point in me being noble now because I have been anything, I've been everything but noble in the past. So there's no point in doing it now. This story suggests that maybe there is a point in doing it now. The change is good whenever it happens. This is also an invitation for me anyway to look at the people that I have put on the other side 
uh, the ones beyond the pale and wonder how they got beyond the pale and what would it take for them to come back across the line? Um, I mean, I, 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 I know what's going to happen in this story. Uh, I don't want to jump too far ahead. Um, but Judah uh, and his brothers are redeemed in Joseph eye, Joseph's eyes. Okay, not yet in the text, but we know it's coming. Um, so but as I just look at this, at what, what Judah's doing now, and I consider what Judah has done in the past, uh, I, I, I wonder what it would take for me to accept that somebody has changed. How much redemption is required before I'm okay with it? Um, so I'm imagining somebody who opposes me in all things, somebody who has hurt me, somebody that I despise. And then as I think about it, I wonder, okay, so what would it take for them to be uh, accepted in my eyes? What would it take for me to respect them? What would it take for me to trust them? What would it take for me to like them? And I think about it hard. I recognize there are some people for whom I cannot imagine that ever happening. There is no way that I am ever going to like that so-and-so. There is no way that I will ever respect them. There is no way that I can ever sit at the table with those people and try and create something. I recognize those words. And this story suggests to me that those words are short-sighted. This story is presenting to me a difference. Judah was not a good person. He wasn't a good person. He was self-serving. Judah, uh, all the things around Judah were poison. His kids were so bad that God got rid of them. Let's remember, God hasn't gotten rid of Judah. So Judah's kids are worse than he is. Right? Judah denies this, this, this vulnerable woman denies her any kind of justice or protection. Um, Judah is not a good guy, and yet here he is being good. If I were there, would I accept him as doing good? Would I trust his goodness? This is the invitation. The story, to me, anyway, invites me to start to wonder about that. What does it take, and can I ever do it? Because the thing is, if I could never do it, if I could never, ever imagine somebody being back into, if I can never imagine respecting somebody again, or, or um, accepting them back into whatever the fold may be, if I could never imagine that, then how is my faith going? What is my trust in God to help people change? What is my trust in, in, in the rest of humanity that God has also created, as wonderfully and fearfully as I'm created? And, you know, we, we can bring up the characters of history and go, well, yes, but surely, to goodness, you can't say that you could ever, you know, you could ever respect Hitler. I got it. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I don't know how you do that. I don't know. Watching the world right now, I look at some people and I think, well, I just, the world would be better if you didn't exist. And if they turn around tomorrow and did something wonderful, I realize that I don't think I want to hear it. In an age of cancel culture, we certainly recognize that, uh, where, where, where people do things uh, and say things um, and then we stop listening to them completely. Having done this, you can never be of value again. And yet this story challenges us to recognize that there are some horrible people who can change. And yeah, I, I, I even hear the voice in my head going, Norm, don't be naive. When somebody tells you who they are, trust them. You know that's who they are. Um, and that's true. I do hear my voice saying that. But you know what? I'm pretty sure that's not God's voice. I'm also pretty sure that I'm not meant to be perfect, that I got to work at this. But for me, this is the invitation um, to understand those around me that they could actually change. And then if I'm really honest, to acknowledge that me, I too, I can change.
because I don't think that I've ever been as rotten a guy as Judah. But I think that I have been um, less of a good guy than I am today. And every now and again, I wonder how often I decide, nah, there's no point. There's no point in being in being noble in this point because I'm not all that noble. There's no point in being brave because you know what? I, in the past, I, I've, I've, I've checked out. But this story tells me that it's always time to be noble and that it is time to be brave. Yeah. I look at Judah and I realize what's really happened is that Judah has moved from self-interest into compassion. He doesn't want his little brother to suffer. He knows that his little brother had nothing to do with this. So he would rather bear the weight of that than his brother. Maybe because he also recognizes the things that he's done in the past. He's there in Egypt. He knows he's the guy who suggested selling his brother into slavery. So maybe he goes, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's time for me to pay for that. This may not be a direct payment, but but it's my time. I am more deserving of this than Benjamin. Or he might look at it and go, like, I've been through enough. I can take this better than Benjamin can. Or more to the point, I don't want Benjamin to suffer. Even more than that, I don't want my father to suffer. I'm not doing the calculus of the fact that he's not going to live that much longer anyway. I'm going to let go of the fact that I may have tried to usurp him and I didn't respect his authority. But now what I know is that I love him and I don't want him to hurt. The difference between Judah then and Judah now would appear to be compassion. Compassion. And it's never too late to learn compassion or to broaden your experience of compassion. And I'm starting to preach, so I'm going to stop right there. Let me offer this prayer. Loving God, we thank you for ancient stories that are relevant today. Stories that give us a look into others' lives and yet also help us peer into ourselves. God, as we wonder about Judah's redemption, let us consider our own let the wandering today invite us into, into change, into greater compassion. And may it bring us closer to each other and to you. We pray in the name of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And with that, I will, I will bid you good day. And I mean that. Have a good day. Uh, and uh, yeah, take some time for gratitude. Take some time for compassion and know that there are people who are glad about you. They're grateful for you and, and they, they feel for and with you. You're not alone. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.